I'm Ken. I'm a pharmacist, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I was once asked, which came first, the alcoholism or pharmacy? I can't remember a time when both were not present in my life. But I never thought that one day <laughs> I would be sitting on a park bench wondering what had become of me because I was sitting there with no family, no food, no job, no income, and not knowing where I was going to sleep that night. But <laughs> in the basement of my last employer was my pharmacy license. I still had that. And that's about all that really mattered to me at that time. Pharmacy was the most, and my license was the most important thing to me. I grew up in a pharmacy family. I was once asked by a, a Pennsylvania State Board member, which came first, routine? And I said, pharmacy and alcoholism are both genetic for me. <laughs> my father was a pharmacist. I had two uncles that were pharmacists. My mother housed pharmacy students because I grew up just a few blocks from this campus. My father had a drugstore that ironically was only six blocks from here up Woodland Avenue. My life was pharmacy. It's the only profession I ever knew. For that reason, it had this ubiquitous presence in my childhood. My male role models were the students, family, that I only ever applied and enrolled in one college. On campus, I was introduced to a new phenomenon called binge drinking. <laughs> and looking back, what I see is that, that my drinking progressed both in volume and frequency much more than that of my peers. I had horrific hangovers. But I'm a pharmacy student. I'm sitting in lecture halls learning about things like opioids for headaches. I treated my hangovers. I also, by the time I was graduating, was on the balancing act that the opioids would take care of the hangover headache, but boy, sedate me. So I was using amphetamines, and they would make me anxious, so I was using benzos. Every day of my life, was alcohol, benzos, opioids, amphetamines. After I graduated, uh, I started drinking even un more uncontrollably. They say that uh, an addicted pharmacist will lose his or her life before they will lose their license. And I sort of lived that. My drinking was out of control daily use of different medications, I found that I compromised any values, any ethics. I was breaking laws. I had guilt and I had remorse be behind my alcoholism, and I didn't know how to stop. Well, being college-educated healthcare professional, I said, I'll go to healthcare professionals for this problem. I went to psychiatrists, psychologists. I went to drug and alcohol counselors. I attended different self-improvement programs. And in the 13 years from graduation until recovery, what I encountered was not one day did I breathe a sober breath with all those attempts to stop and with all those professionals. One day at work, <laughs> working in a retail pharmacy, at the beginning, early in the morning, I doubled over in intense stomach pain. I found out later I had perforated my stomach. I worked my eight-hour shift with the aid of lots of opioids. I got off work. I had to protect my license and my job, so I didn't leave with that intense pain. I finished my shift. I ended up reporting to an emergency department. The emergency department, the staff told me that I came in in walking shock and that 
stomach acid was bathing all of my organs for eight hours or so, and that I was going into uh, some kind of uh, systemic sepsis. And that if I'd have waited much longer, they wouldn't have been able to keep me alive. I would have died. They told me when the surgeon said, that was a chemical burn in your stomach. Alcohol, maybe drugs too. Of course, I denied it. Had to protect the license. I was discharged and told that I was going to have grave consequences if I continued to drink. I stopped and got a drink on the way home of discharge because I was in withdrawal. My brain, it's a brain disease. I was in withdrawal. I didn't know it at the time. I really thought something was morally wrong with me. <laughs> Interesting thing about those professionals is that they told me the reason I drank was because I hadn't identified some unknown early childhood trauma. Well, to this day, I still don't know about any early childhood trauma. They also told me it was the way my mother nursed me. They told me that with my intellect and my education, uh, particularly in pharmacology, I should know better and just quit. Well, knowledge does not provide amnesty to a disease. And addiction is not a choice. These people didn't know what they were talking about. They told me grave consequences ahead if you continue to drink. Well, I drank. Around two years or so after this, I reported to an emergency, a friend took me to an emergency department because I was laying on the bathroom floor enjoying the cold tile. I couldn't get up and walk. Sitting in the last wheelchair in the triage line, I bottomed out, I went into cardiac arrest. A physician walking by saw white lips, and he said he'd only ever seen white lips on cadavers. He was concerned. <laughs> he, resuscit <laughs> he resuscitated me, and I was told I bled 85 to 90 percent of my blood. At this time, they transfused. A couple days later, they discharged me, and they told me, if you drink or drug again, you're not going to live for more than two years or so. Almost two years to the date, I repeat that episode, except this time I hemorrhaged 90% of my blood. I set records on the lowest hemoglobin ever recorded in this hospital, whatever that was. On that occasion, they took out most of my stomach, they took out the duodenum, and they performed a vagotomy, and they removed my spleen. They told me that if I picked up and drank again, <clears throat> I wouldn't live more than six months. <clears throat> I got home, <clears throat> and I'm crawling around the floor trying to find some drugs because I was in severe withdrawal, and my brain only knew one thing. I crawled over to a couch or sofa, put my shoulder under it, did a push-up so I could reach up and grab a bottle of an opioid, and I ingested it. I laid back on the floor to see I popped staples and popped the incision, and I was bleeding and had fluid. And I'd been told six months, and I just laid back on the floor, and I said, please, please, can it come sooner than six months? months. Somebody at that hospital <clears throat> told me that I probably would want to look into one of these mutual help programs. They're for people real desperate. Well, I never thought I was that desperate before. <laughs> I went to one of these meetings, and in this meeting, I met a gentleman. He came up and he said, my name is Ken. I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, and I'm a physician. And he told me his story of recovery. He told me he shared what I had been performing and doing in my life. He had the guilt, the remorse about his violation of values, ethics, of his use of substances. 
sending family away and so forth, but that he found recovery because peers at the workplace detected he had a problem and they were able to use his license as leverage, as an asset to perform an intervention. And these were members of the Pennsylvania Physicians Peer Assistance Program. Physicians had one, docs had one, pharmacy didn't. He said, same kind of recovery could happen for me if I would follow direction that he would give me. He was the light at the end of my tunnel that I had been looking for for years. I look back and I think this gentleman saved my life. <clears throat> One day, I'm now in recovery, I'm going to, and an interesting thing, remember the park bench? That was in recovery. The park bench wasn't in addiction like it is for most people. I had my addiction bottom to bleeding. My recovery bottom was homelessness. It was no food. I lost 80 pounds in 10 months because I had to leave my profession, the one thing I knew to do. Because if I would have gone and asked for help, you know what the state board would do? Revoke or suspend and recommend incarceration because I had classmates and friends that that's what happened when they reached out for help. I met a pharmacist in a meeting who was in recovery. We remarked to each other, where are they? <laughs> We know there's lots of pharmacists and pharmacy students out there who have alcohol drug problems, but they're not in the rooms recovering. What's going on? He and I started SARF, Secundum Artem, Reaching Pharmacists with Help. It's the peer assistance program in the state of Pennsylvania. We didn't want anybody to have the stories that we had. We didn't want them to incur jails, institutions, and death. The state board didn't know what to do with these people. We went to the state board to help start SARF. When we went there, they said, wow, the, the incidence of cases that we're seeing regarding alcohol and substance abuse with pharmacists and pharmacy students has skyrocketed. And all we know is punitive. We have just noticed suspend and revoke licenses. They said, we don't have a solution. We said, let us be your solution. So we did start this program, SARF, but the core of our solution was that we put together a monitoring contract. Now, SARF is pretty much educational, interventional, and referral to treatment and monitoring. But we had to prove to the state board and other legal authorities that these pharmacists indeed were drug free, that they're in recovery. That's the core of this monitoring contract. It has 17 stipulations in it. It's totally confidential. There's co-signatories. The family can be involved. The employer is involved. The state board, of course, maybe a district attorney, a probation officer, all those people would be co-signatories and would have access to what would be confidential information otherwise. This contract is what led to the success of SARF. Over the last 35 years, SARF has been able to help close to 9,000 pharmacists and pharmacy students in the state of Pennsylvania. We were able to demonstrate the success. Now, the treatment industry claims about a 40 to 60% recovery rate at the end of a year. SARF has a 92 to 95% recovery rate during the three-year contract over a period of 35 years. We have that history. SARF has been a success. What we were able to do was go to pharmacists that we knew wanted to get sober and clean, didn't want to keep living the lives they were doing, suffered severe guilt, remorse, most of them I'll say, not all, and we were able to reach out to them where that want to get sober was. They wanted to but didn't know where to turn without 
going to jail, losing license, and so forth. So we were able to nurture this want from them and turn it into recovery. So if we can be that successful in a profession like pharmacy, where they're handling the meds on a daily basis, most of them, how about society in general? Don't we have a society where most people in society with a substance use disorder really want to stop? Most of them, I've worked in the treatment industry since 1985. So I'm saying this from personal hands-on experience as a treatment person. Most of them, when they get into treatment, admit that they really wanted but didn't know how to work on that want and to get help. We, as society, can help these individuals. We need to look for that want, find something that they value, because everybody has something like a pharmacy license that they value. We can tell them they can keep that thing, they can keep family, whatever, if they get into this process of recovery. I'm asking people today to advocate for those who have substance use disorders. We need to change a lot of policies that we have today. What I would like to see people advocate for and get involved is that everyone have access to evidence-based best practices in chemical dependency or substance use disorders. And that includes access to naloxone and other life-saving medications and all the other evidence-based best practices. In fact, use all of them if we need to, because <laughs> they work together. Longer lengths of stay, research has shown that longer lengths of stay are the number one indicator of success in recovery. So please think about how you can advocate. That anesthesiologist lifted me up when I was down and out and saved my life. He lifted me up so that I could turn around and lift up others. So I'm saying, how about everyone? advocate, think about somebody in your life. It doesn't have to be substance use disorders. There's somebody in distress who you can reach out and you can help. Think about how you can lift them up and they can lift themselves up through the empowerment you provide them. It's been said that the greatest thing a person can do in life is to lift others up so that they can lift themselves up. Thank you. <laughs>